Let's talk about the differences between our hordes and our elite armies, our gun lines versus heavy assault forces, and our Death Stars versus multiple small units. Today we're going through Warhammer 40k Army Archetypes. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today I thought we'd do a bit of an overview in the various different ways that you can build your army in Warhammer 40k. It's certainly a question that I get asked fairly frequently, and I feel like the answer might be a little bit more complicated than it appears at first glance, depending on exactly what sort of thing that you're asking for for a force. Generally speaking, what I'm trying to talk about in this video are the broad ways in which you can describe what an army is or does. Say, for example, getting a general feel of an army like an orc mechanised list, where you have a whole bunch of boys riding in trucks or battle wagons, or making distinctions in playstyle, say, for example, a space marine gun line castle, compared with, say, Blood Angels, multiple small units fighting in melee. It's all a bit inexact, and most of the armies in the game tend to blur the lines between one and another, and you could certainly have multiple labels applied to certain parts of the list, but in this video we'll try and differentiate between some of them, and talk about some of their typical strengths and weaknesses. I think, generally speaking, perhaps one of the most helpful ways to think about classifying armies is how they choose to output damage, say, for example, versus range versus melee focus, or maybe psychic, the unit types that the army might take in abundance, say for example hordes versus elite armies, or big heavy hitters with a bunch of monsters, or mechanised armies in transports, and then finally the ways in which you can play the army, which can certainly overlap with the first two, say for example are you making an aggressive army that's going to rush the enemy, something that's going to play a bit more cagey, hiding behind terrain and striking out, and is your army going to be all about big synergies, castles and death stars, versus multiple small units operating across the board. Today we're going to talk through each of those three areas in turn, and the things within them, and talk about why some of the player styles are better and worse within 40k at the moment. First up, I thought we'd talk about quote-unquote balanced armies, things that bring multiple different elements to the fight, and don't really try and go in for one strategy of any one sort, maybe having a small castle alongside some fast movers, some heavy hitters, and some cheap multiple small unit chaff. I feel like in general Games Workshop have done a fairly good job in 9th edition towards pushing towards armies that look like this, and maybe look like a bit more like armies, as opposed to weird spam of one particular thing, or one particular way of doing things. In general games like 40k have a bit of a tendency towards trying to encourage people to go down doing all one thing, say for example just overloading people with targets of one particular type to the extent where they can't deal with them, and that definitely breaks through a fair bit. But particularly in 9th edition, there's a whole bunch of factors that make you want to include multiple different unit types within an army, and have you fighting on multiple fronts. One of them's objective and secondary objectives, that incentivizes some infantry and expendable units to trade and sacrifice, compared with investing in nothing but heavy hitters. Those damage dealers are going to be important for the list and destroying the enemy army, but they often tend to be less good for objectives and want to be protected and screened so they don't just get killed first. Army construction often means that you need to fill slots, taking along basic troop slots, HQs, and maybe certain other force organisation slots that you might not necessarily want to. Stratagems, I think, help unit diversity as well, often incentivising you just to take one copy of a unit if they have a good stratagem, and that also sort of incentivises you to mix things up a bit. And compared with at least in past editions, where having all things having one big defensive profile was very important, as otherwise you were just going to get alpha striked off the board, with 9th edition line of sight blocking terrain rules, it often means that you can hide a decent chunk of your army, so having everything being super tough to the enemy alpha strike isn't actually that essential. For that reason you do get a whole bunch of armies that maybe have one core playstyle, but then say have a bunch of support of one sort or another, and allowing you to reap the benefits of shooting and melee, heavy hitters and expendable units, and some tough battle line units, and some things that can skirt around the edges and make good use of terrain. For all that though, balanced armies by their nature might well struggle to deal with certain very skewed lists, say for example if your opponent just turns up with nothing but heavy hitting damage dealers, you probably are going to lose the damage game, and it's going to be about the other units mitigating that, winning the mission, and maybe making sure those damage dealers can't fight a maximum effect all the time. It is quite nice though that at least some more balanced armies are kind of incentivised by the game at the moment. If we start to look at builds that skew one way or another though, then let's start out by talking about the different types of damage. Generally people will tend to classify them either as gun lines, assault armies, or psychic armies, and you can go very heavy on one of the three elements if you want to. First up we've got gun lines, armies that want to destroy the foe primarily with shooting, maybe typical examples being things like the Tau Empire with their lack of melee, the Astra Militarum, or the Adeptus Mechanicus. Most other factions can do some sort of gunline type build, and depending on the army they can be more or less mobile, or sometimes fairly static and just sit and shoot. I feel like gunlines are often fairly simple within 40k, 
Pretty understandable to just try and take more guns than the opponent and outshoot them in a straight firefight. Shooting is generally a fair bit more predictable and safe than melee, which has got multiple different ways in which things can go wrong. Dedicating an entire army to being all about winning the shooting game will generally mean that you do win any direct firefights, though it might well come at the expense of other options. In 9th edition missions in particular, the missions terrain setup and objectives generally mean that you can't just afford to sit back and annihilate your enemy off the table before moving up. You could do that fairly effectively in previous editions, but not so much at the moment. At least something in your army needs to get stuck in and scoring objectives in the midfield fairly early, even if it's just expendable units trying to grab some points. And also the terrain rules mean that often you're going to have a whole load of things hidden from your own army's direct line of fire, usually meaning that you're going to be having to move your gun line units around, try and get some crucial line of sight on the most important enemy units, and remove them from the table as fast as you can. Other potential weaknesses are things like units getting locked up in combat, and if your units aren't quite efficient enough, then certain ones could just be basically ignored all game long, while the opponent goes about winning the game anyway. And just in general, gun lines are often looked down on a little bit within 40k, maybe being seen by some as just being a little bit less interactive than other ways of playing, maybe if you've got a bit more of a mix of assault and shooting elements, and are forced to move forward and take some risks. I'd say this whole attitude is maybe a little bit less important in ninth though, where you do genuinely have to move up and fight for the objectives, provided there's enough terrain on the table. And often playing a gun line can be somewhat frustrating in yourself if you can't get lines of sight on key enemy targets, because they're all hiding behind ruins. Definitely having a solid amount of shooting in a list though tends to be an asset though, not a negative. On the other extreme, you could skew into a heavy melee army with a whole load of close combat forces, cutting down your foes with all sorts of power weapons and chain swords. And armies that like to do this at the moment could be things like certain Chaos Space Marine Legions, Blood Angels and Space Wolves, Chaos Demons, and the vast majority of other armies in the game can build fairly heavy for melee if they really want to, things like Orcs, Nids, Sisters of Battle, Adeptus Custodes, and more. Going big on melee definitely has its positives and negatives versus range. Generally melee units will deal much more damage than their equivalent points of shooting ones, but perhaps with the fairly obvious downside that there's a lot of barriers to get into combat. Obviously you need to move across the board while not being shot, you might fail your charge, you might well have the enemy just counter charge you when you try and get there. They can use that counter offensive stratagem to interrupt in combat. Certain characters can really hamper melee like fights last things. You might be screened by enemy chaff units, or the enemies might try and run away or shoot you down in overwatch. There really are a lot of problems with getting combat units into melee, but the reward tends to be worth it when they do get there. And as mentioned already, good line of sight blocking terrain type rules do make things easier. Certainly fast moving melee armies can jump from cover to cover and potentially get a charge off before they're shot. In prior editions of 40k, gun lines really were the way to go, but in 9th edition we've had multiple armies rise and fall that do credibly both at range and in combat. Other advantages are charging and locking up ranged units, which might shut down their shooting. And powerful melee in itself does mean that the opponent has to play a bit cagier when they're trying to take objectives early in the game. If you've still got a whole bunch of scary melee troops left, then the opponent putting some units out into the midfield to score some objectives and things like that might just be giving you some really easy charges and potentially even bonus movements. There's definitely things that are easier to deal with in shooting rather than combat though. Things like small expendable enemy units that you don't really want to be sending your shock assault units after. If your only way of killing things is combat, if the enemy puts an expendable unit out in the open, you might well be forced to charge it and then have them all gun down your fancy unit afterwards. There's definitely armies that can skew heavily towards it. I'd say that usually having at least a little bit of range and a little bit of melee is good for a list, though you can go pretty hard one way or the other. Of course, for damage dealing phases of the game, we also have a psychic phase as well. Maybe it's a little bit more of an army functioning mechanic as opposed to just raw damage dealing, but some armies definitely have the psychic phase right in the centre of their army strategy, belting out a whole bunch of mortal wounds, but also giving your own troops big damage and defence buffs, plus hindering the enemy army and making them easier to kill in one way or another. Perhaps out of all of the 40k armies, things like the Thousand Sons and Grey Knights do exemplify that the best. Craft worlds usually tend to be very very heavy on psychers as well, between their warlocks and farseers and their great psychic powers. Perhaps one of the main strengths is that they can usually just throw out a whole bunch of mortal wounds at the enemy if they need to. It makes it really quite risky to assault them with elite troops, as they might just be hoovered straight off the board with the mortal wound return fire. And beyond that, psychic powers just often allow you to break normal rules of the game. Things like denying imbols, teleporting your forces around the board, or hindering enemy saves to an extent that they wouldn't normally. I feel like they can often be quite good at dealing with heavy hitting enemy armies, things like big knights and stuff. Say for example if you had an Eldar Psychers cast Doom and Jinx on a Titanic Knight. 
As a phase though, it's definitely a lot riskier and a bit more of a mental load compared with shooting or assault, I think. The majority of psychic powers have at least a fairly reasonable chance of failing, and there's also things like perils of the warp, and some hard counters like enemy psychic denials, or things like collectors assassins or sisters of silence to deal with. If a key cast gets denied by a stratagem or something, it could throw a real spanner in the works if it's something that you needed for your army to function. As well as that, mortal wound damage could be a bit overkill against certain armies. It's all very good if you're chewing through something with multiple tough layers of durability, but if you're just fighting against enemy hordes, it might be a bit wasted. In general, even the most psychically heavy armies in the game back it up by a fair amount of shooting and melee typically, so it's perhaps a little bit less all-consuming than if you go 100% gun line or 100% assault. Otherwise, and perhaps the other very typical way of classifying armies might be what sort of unit types you're using within the army. Again, often the idea of this is often to overload the enemy's capabilities to deal with one target, say taking hordes with more models that they can shoot, a bunch of heavy hitters like a whole load of tanks that the enemy can't take down, or just going very heavy on other bits of the force organisation chart to make your army particularly good at one particular fighting style. First up, and really quite common within 40k, are fairly elite armies. Generally speaking, tough and points expensive troops with solid damage dealing, but usually you don't get very many of them to compensate. In general, just about every Space Marine and Chaos Space Marine list will fall under this remit in general, plus particularly armies like Adeptus Custodes, maybe Destroyer Heavy Necrons, Tau Battlesuits, and the various Space Marine Terminator armies like Dark Angels. There's a whole load of big and stompy units with quality damage out there. Elite armies like these generally have pretty good quality shooting and melee, often attacking with powerful special weapons or power swords and things in combat, and you might often find them just solidly advancing towards objectives in the midfield, shrugging off enemy small arms and things with their good armour, and daring the enemy to come in range to try and take the points and fight them man to man. Light firepower without much AP is often kind of wasted, and they often have units that really aren't too bad at just taking the brunt of the enemy firepower and only taking minimal damage. If they don't have any auxiliary troops though, they might really struggle for board control and screening, if you're getting fewer models, you're not going to be able to be able to be all over the board. Enemies might be able to deep strike a bit more freely. And with threat ranges in 40k, if the enemy's in range of your army, they're typically going to be in range of something important. A lot of them, though not all of them, tend to be at least fairly slow and might struggle to bring their raw power to bear unless the opponent actively engages them. Depending on the mission and things, your opponent might be able to have a round or two of just shooting them before counter-attacking as the elites tend to slog across the board. For each of these defensive profile spam builds, obviously they'll be weak to their own weapons that kill them. For elite infantry, there are quite a lot of weapons in 40k that are mid to high AP and either damage 2 or damage 3, meaning that each failed save might kill a space marine or a terminator or something. Overall, I've certainly been an army build that has had some decent success throughout 9th edition, though chunky elites maybe are struggling a little bit more than they previously were at the moment. On the flip side, rather than investing everything in a few big models, why not take an absolute horde of one wound infantry? Things like Orc Boys, Imperial Guardsmen, Tyranid Gaunts, Gene Stealer Cult Neophytes, and plenty of other choices within the game. Even Admech can strangely do hordes if desired now. Big blocks of Skitari Vanguard and Rangers do seem to be pretty popular. Usually the idea with hordes is just to spam more bodies than the opponent has bullets, Often in 40k, lists might gravitate towards things that have a few really big shots to take down the enemy's heaviest things, and those sort of weapon profiles are just rarely going to be all that good at killing horde units. Typically their damage dealing can be a little bit low, but usually with the raw volume of attacks they get, they should be fairly comfortably deleting enemy infantry units, though they might be struggling against things with particularly good saves or tough targets like heavy vehicles and monsters. Unfortunately, overall though, Horde armies are just generally really quite weak in 9th edition ever since it started, and certainly at the moment. Over the course of 8th and 9th, Games Workshop really seems to have amped up the efficiency of anti-infantry weapons, giving out more shots and better AP and things, and even when you take the most maximal amount of bodies that you can put on the table, it's often not too uncommon for them just to be wiped out by the game's end anyway. Things are maybe just a little bit limited from being truly ridiculous like they were in previous editions where you could be spamming out 3 point models and things, everything in 9th edition costs at least 5, so ridiculous body count armies are just a little bit less feasible than they were. Besides just often not having quite enough durability to quite make the cut, I feel like hordes do have their other downsides. They're kind of slow and might struggle to react to the enemy, say a more dynamic fast unit jumping in and killing a bunch of stuff, and then you might struggle to bring other bodies to bear. The amount of small arms in the army does mean that they'll struggle to kill hard targets like tanks somewhat, 
And unless you've got some way to mitigate things like morale rules for Tyranid synapse and things, then you can have a fair amount of your vital bodies just fleeing off the board, say for example Orcs. Finally, I think that Hordes don't get on particularly well with the Ninth Edition terrain rules. Often you can have fairly fragile stuff that hides behind terrain, but if you go really maximal on Horde bodies, then you're just going to have too many models to hide behind the terrain pieces. Your opponent's going to be getting some good lines of sight and things in the first turn, and the extra bodies beyond a certain extent that you could hide might be kind of wasted. I do kind of feel that it might be at least partly deliberate game design on Games Workshop to try and keep ridiculous Ultra Hordes off the table. Perhaps more than anything, just from a practical ease of playing for 40k, I did always feel it was a little bit ridiculous when armies with 250 or more models could theoretically be one of the strongest things that you could field. They're a bit of a slog to play with and against if you do it too often, even if the sight on the board can look kind of glorious. Moving on, let's talk about armies that are primarily built around just a few really big heavy hitters. I'm not sure if that's the best way to describe them in 40k, but in general this is the idea for investing a large amount of points in really big scary models, things like vehicles, monsters, dreadnoughts, and perhaps even tanks and armour, often things that have some of the best damage and defensive profiles in the army, and might well just overload the enemy's capability of dealing with them with the amount of anti-tank weapons they could have. Obviously these things deal damage in very different ways, some of them do a little bit of shooting and melee, tanks are going to be entirely ranged focused, where certain monsters are going to be entirely combat focused, but in general the idea is somewhat similar, really big chunky things that deal efficient damage, maybe typical armies being things like Imperial or Chaos Knights, Adeptus Custodius spamming Dreadnoughts and Caladiuses, Tyranids with a monster mash type list, Demons with Bellacor plus maybe a few greater demons, or maybe Astra Militarum tank spam with a whole bunch of Lehman Rosses trundling towards the enemy and lighting things up. In more balanced lists, these guys will often be at the centre of a list, kind of protected from attack and being supported by other cheaper units, but I feel like the temptation is always there just to go really heavy on them and just attempt to obliterate the opponent's army off the board as soon as possible. Hopefully you should have a whole bunch of damage dealing with killing some of the most important things early and the threat overload will stop your opponent from killing all of your stuff. For downsides, obviously running into anything with excessive amounts of anti-tank firepower or a heavy mortal wound output will certainly be bad news for these guys. And with a bit of a lack of infantry and supporting units, you might well struggle a bit more than normal with objective scoring and secondary objectives, a lot of which is more geared towards infantry, unless you happen to play things like Imperial Knights where the objectives are specifically designed for them. Otherwise, things that could get in the way will be things like debuffs, say Psychic Maledictions, or Vote and Judgment tokens stacking on the scariest models around, and potentially like the Horde somewhat, if you get a lot of really big monstrous creatures and heavy hitters, you might not be able to hide all of them behind terrain, so you might start to get into diminishing returns as the enemy might be able to alpha strike you a bit better. Definitely can be pretty viable though, if you do manage to just take the fight of the enemy and basically destroy the core of their army, they're very unlikely to be winning the game even if they've done all rational objectives up to that point. Another very common build in 40k are mechanised armies, a bunch of infantry fighting out of transports, maybe supported by a few tanks and ranged units as well. I feel like for a lot of armies you might just want a few units in transports, but some lists definitely go all in for almost everything embarked, Perhaps armies like Drukhari and Harlequins in particular go for that, but otherwise things like Guard Kazakin, Orc Battle Wagons and Kill Rigs, or maybe a whole bunch of World Eaters, Corn Berserkers and Rhinos, all are pretty reasonable ways of running mechanised armies. I'd say perhaps one of the biggest advantages of these guys are that they're usually fairly tough. A lot of points are invested in transports, which don't tend to have that great guns, and that usually means that they're fairly tough for the cost, and plus it can be kind of annoying to deal with the combined transport and infantry units, Say if you've got to try and assault them, you're going to kill the transport but not the infantry. And if you're shooting them, if the other player parks the transport next to terrain, you might well kill the transport and then the squad gets out behind terrain or onto an objective or something and you might not have the rest of the shots to deal with them. Mechanised lists should also have plenty of speed with the transport zooming things about and getting them where they need to go, plus plenty of infantry units for objectives and taking them. And the transports can act fairly expendably and just become nuisances or other bodies on objectives after their main role is done. As for downsides, I feel like only certain armies really want to credibly do this to be honest. I feel like the infantry units need to have the right balance, where they're both a little bit on the fragile side and need delivering up close, but also are dangerous enough to actually justify you buying the transport, as opposed to just buying more threatening infantry squads. If the infantry are nice and durable as well, then you probably don't need the transports either, and they can just foot slog in greater numbers.
Despite this, the damage output could be a little bit low for mechanised lists. You are investing a lot of points in transports that aren't the best damage dealers, and the infantry squads inside might not quite make up for that. And unlike a few of the previous examples, your opponent might be able to make very good use of both their anti-tank and anti-infantry firepower. If things fall wrong, then you might well be losing multiple transports and multiple squads of infantry per turn. Still though, definitely a very usable one for some armies. Harlequins and Star Weavers and Drukarian Raiders have been doing pretty well for the majority of the edition, and plenty of the others do fine. Next up, and maybe in a few ways having a bit of overlap with the other army types that we've talked about, are faster armies. Could be various different things, vehicles or jump infantry and stuff, but generally units that tend to be a bit more fragile, jumping around the board and potentially delivering some very dangerous damage when they either get their shooting or close combat to work. Perhaps typical armies for this might be things like Blood Angels, Harlequins, Drukari again, the Orc Speedwire with a bunch of boggies maybe, any heavy biker army which certain factions can do. And back from before when Games Workshop banned the use of more than two flies in match play for 40k, fly armies will probably be fitting in here as well. I'd certainly say that fast armies definitely have a big leg up compared with other opponents in 40k. They can make great use of terrain, jumping around from piece to piece and hopefully not getting shot too much, and it often means that they can get the first strike on the opponent. I'd say perhaps more so than quite a lot of other army builds, they can really alter their playstyle as well. For example, if you've got an opponent that doesn't want units up close to them, you could be zooming them across the board super quickly and just rushing them and getting into combat and stuff. If you've got an opponent that's got short-ranged units, you could potentially outrange them and play KG for a turn or two, and then jump forward and pounce on their units when they get close. They're also particularly nice for hiding and striking out, putting units behind terrain, maybe just sending a couple of things forward to trade out with enemy models, or jumping onto objectives where it makes sense to sacrifice a unit. Generally faster armies do tend to be at least fairly strong for objectives, and secondaries in particular, due to being able to reach multiple parts of the board very easily. For downsides, the main one is usually that with paying for some very good speed, you're usually taking a hit to either your damage or your durability. In particular, fast units don't tend to be enormously tough, and if the opponent can get some sort of damage on them before they get to hit you, or counter-attack hard, they might well be able to remove some very valuable stuff very easily. If they get line of sight with barrage weapons, deep strikers, or their own fast movers, then you might well be losing some big units and really hampering your game plan. Moving on to a couple of slightly more minor types, first up we have artillery armies, something that definitely not every faction can do, but certainly the guard are perhaps the most well known for it, Astra Militarum with a whole bunch of basilisks and manticores and things, though plenty of other armies can have a good go, Space Marines Imperial Fists during 8th edition were fairly fearsome with their Thunderfire Cannons and Whirlwinds, Tyranid Hiveguard, Tau, Smart Missile Systems and Orc Squig Boggies have also all had their days within 9th edition, even if they're not quite as strong anymore. In general, they all revolve around having a whole bunch of big guns that can fire out of line of sight, and meaning that you can just basically delete some enemy units off the table with impunity, even if they might not have the raw damage output that a bunch of direct line of sight firepower has. In general, and certainly compared with 8th edition, Games Workshop does tend to charge a premium for artillery units in 9th, recognising that if you're paying for a Norse line of sight weapon, that's got a really big value in just whittling down a few key enemy units, but maybe just letting people spam artillery pretty much unrestrictedly and just blasting the enemy across the board with no tactics perhaps might not be the best thing for the game. I feel like the vast majority of artillery was kind of balanced before in 9th edition, before certain things like the squig boggies and the smart missile systems took off, but Games Workshop really doubled down on making artillery kind of niche with a barrage nerf in the balanced data slate, making basically every army bar the guard just worse at firing, both in terms of hit rolls and AP. Whenever artillery lists get strong, the advantages are kind of obvious, just blasting off the most important parts of the enemy's army, and they can't hide any fragile things against you, and it kind of puts the onus on the opponent who really have to come to you and try and silence the guns as early as possible, otherwise the most important stuff is just going to be getting destroyed. For weaknesses though, as with gun lines, you just really can't afford to sit back and shoot with the vast majority of your army for multiple turns in ninth. You will need other things to move forward and take those objectives, plus screen out all your artillery from being charged and tied up or something. Currently in the game, as mentioned as well, artillery just seems a little bit too underpowered to currently be the core strategy of most armies. I'm certainly not saying that guard artillery lists couldn't do a fair amount of work, but I feel like in general more efficient options from the codex tend to be things like the Lehman Rosses and Kazakin and things, strong direct damage dealers rather than a whole load of ignores line of sight stuff. Generally I think the onus is in 9th edition is if you've got efficient artillery, you probably just want to take one or two as a small luxury buy and use it to take out absolutely critical things like say a threatening enemy infantry unit that just had a couple of models left or some critical objective scorers. 
Finally, if we're looking at certain units, we've also got Hero Hammer style armies. Again, something that's a bit more niche and has kind of risen and fallen over 40k's past. The general idea behind this is that they're trying to get the best value out of various scary character models that provide good boosts to your battle line units, but also certainly carry their own weight in melee, and it's actually the characters that might be the primary threat of the list. I feel like Hero Hammer type armies tended to be a bit stronger in 8th edition, where you had things like Assassin Spam wandering around towards the start of it, or Blood Angel Smash Captains and Custodes Shield Captains on bikes doing work. I feel like the existence of that Supreme Command attachment that allows you to spam a bunch of HQs, that was certainly something that made the whole thing a bit more viable. Maybe for factions that can credibly give this a go, I'd say that Chaos Space Marine armies are maybe one of the best examples right now. It can make some seriously scary Smash characters with things like Demon Princes with Goax, the Lord Discordant with Flames of Spite, and of course Abaddon the Despoiler. Having those three in a list are just three enormous melee threats, all of which can get screened behind other units. Otherwise, various flavours of Space Marines tend to do quite well. Space Wolves tend to maybe be particularly prevalent with hero hammer type things, with big heroic interventions, and a bunch of cool fighting melee options. I guess you could see things like spamming Tower Crisis Commanders as a bit more of a ranged Xenos alternative. For strengths, I guess the main appeal is getting some very souped up characters with often ridiculous melee damage, and having the opponent not really be able to shoot them until they get into combat. It can be kind of frustrating to play against, characters can hide or just stand behind something particularly tanky, and almost guarantee that you get to use their fun toys on the enemy. As for downsides, if you're investing a whole ton of your points in expensive characters, in general the army does tend to have slightly lower durability overall. You're going to have less battle line units, and when the characters are exposed, they're usually easier to kill than their equivalent points in foot troops. I guess theoretically sniper weapons could be one big thing to look out for, but most of them aren't enormously efficient in 40k currently. And even if they aren't on the table, you might have to just play with the army a bit more carefully than most armies. If your characters get exposed and shot down early, you're going to be in for a bad time. In 9th edition as well, I do think that the force organisation chart not being as friendly to it certainly doesn't help it. If you want more than 3 HQs out of battalions and things, you're going to have to be shelling out for multiple detachments. And that involves bringing yet more troops along that you might or might not want, and taking command points away from buying in warlord traits and relics, both of which are pretty vital for characters when they're being maxed out. Finally, I think that the third major way of looking at Warhammer 40k armies is to class them by their playstyle and some of the main ways in which they use their units to engage with the enemy. For example, there's big centralised builds around a castle or a Death Star versus multiple small units, and then armies that generally don't want to be engaging with the foe quite so directly, things like armies that hide behind terrain and strike out, or use sneaky tricks to get the other hand, compared with armies that are just going to out and out rush you and beat you down with efficient damage dealing. First up, for the big centralised investment type strategies, we've got castle armies. Broadly speaking, a castle type army in Warhammer 40k is a whole bunch of units clustered around some powerful supporting characters with auras, giving them big defensive or damage boosts. I think typically you'd be more talking about shooting units more so than melee, maybe being a bit more of a gunline strategy, though plenty of the castle type builds will often just want to move up the board, and then maybe when the enemy gets within charge range, perhaps break ranks and send all the elements into combat where the various characters can make use of their fairly good melee profiles. With character rules the way that they are at the moment, a lot of army lists tend to have a castle style element, even if it is just something simple like a super cheap character with b-roll ones to hit, supporting a couple of gunline units. I say typically space marines tend to do this sort of playstyle best, I've got quite a lot of good supporting characters, maybe in particular Dreadnought Castle style builds, maybe with a Capstone and Tech Marine supporting some Redemptor Dreadnoughts or Relic Contemptors, they're often some of the better ways of them doing it in 9th. You can certainly do kind of similar with infantry though, maybe Terminators slogging towards the enemy, or efficient core ranged unit damage dealers, or potentially building around a character with some very very good rerolls, things like Rebute Gilliman, or Morven Vile of the Sisters of Battle. Otherwise, I do think that Sisters do castles quite well. A whole bunch of rerolls paired with some multi melters tends to do great. Adamek and Guard both have some really cool shooting synergies, things like that Finial Relic for the Guard around a command squad. And the Necrons with the Silent King are a good example too, ideally keeping a whole swathe of their army within range of his rerolls now that just about everything is core. The strengths of this are fairly obvious, just in terms of a points for firepower or durability type metric, it often makes sense to pair very fighty or dangerous units with characters that are going to make them better. And for the points invested, you might well be better off with, say, two of the units plus a character supporting them, compared with just getting three of the units for the numbers that they'll be spitting out. Overall, it will usually mean that you've got a bit of a better chance of winning the damage game, and in general it's an area of the board that your opponent's going to struggle to approach, 
both for the fear of being blasted by a whole bunch of damage, but potentially even getting countercharged by units that might have a bit of value there, like supporting characters with power weapons. Building very, very heavily into a castle, though, I think does have some downsides. You might well be putting out some amazing numbers, but it might mean that you're a little bit too focused all in one area of the board, and you might struggle with board control later on. Again, sniper weapons could be pretty brutal here. Some crucial support characters just aren't all that tough, and losing something like a valuable Skitari Marshal or something could actually be pretty nasty. If it is a mainly gunline castle as well, then the enemy might know where your firepower is going to be, and they might be able to guarantee that they can hide some of the most important stuff from the core of your firepower. And while the on-paper numbers might be great, I often feel that sometimes you can just build castles a little bit too big to be practical. Say, for example, if you have five or six dreadnoughts all tripping over each other and winding up blocking each other's movement when they're trying to navigate around terrain. Still, though, definitely can be a very strong element of a list, but generally needs pairing with other things rather than just stacking everything into one block. In a very similar sort of vein, Death Star type armies, at least when applied to Warhammer 40k, are a huge amount of investment in usually just one super strong unit that's both very tough and will basically destroy anything that it touches. Death Star I did find to be a bit of a weird term when I first started playing, I guess just hobby shorthand for something that's very hard to kill and destroys anything that it attacks. I'd say perhaps the single best example in current Warhammer 40k might be a Chaos Space Marine Terminator build. You can make their Terminators ridiculously tanky with things like Master of Possession, the Black Rune of Damnation, Illusory Supplication and Delightful Agonies, a whole bunch of psychic spells and litanies and things, and the outcome is a unit that's almost pointless to shoot at unless you've got some very heavy firepower, as if you only kill a couple of models, they'll basically just be healing back up. Otherwise, in the current game, things like Dark Angel's Terminator blocks can be pretty similar, supported by an apothecary, and certainly having some features of Death Stars, things like Tau Crisis suit blocks with a whole load of drone support, and the invocation for Feel No Pain, plus any just really, really big models which are huge investment, say Bellacor, Mortarian, or Big Stompy Knights. It's maybe a phenomenon that was a little bit more prevalent in 40k's past, in particular in 7th edition, where for some reason the game rules incentivize enormous great big weird amalgamation units, led by an unlikely cast of characters giving them all manner of strange buffs. In general, the idea behind this is very similar to the castle things, make best use of a whole load of single unit buffs to make something that's both very strong at killing the enemy and also monumentally hard to take out. It often just makes a lot of sense to add more and more onto one stacked unit, as if you've got a tough unit that's going to survive, you may as well have it doing the maximum amount of damage possible. It should mean that your opponent just won't be able to stand against it in one area of the board. You should have one objective in the midfield that you can basically just take straight off the opponent, almost no questions asked, and to some extent dictate the flow of the game. While all this can be very, very powerful, of course it does have some downsides. If you're investing loads and loads of points into one area of the board, it means that your opponent could conceivably just focus on everything else of the army, and even if you have dominated one section of it, if there's just the Death Star and the supporting characters left, you're probably still going to lose the game if you can't take any other objectives or things. Death Stars could also be screened by some expendable units just getting in the way and holding it up for a turn, or it could be kited by an enemy unit that it wants to charge but can't quite. And throwing away a bunch of units like that could be very viable if it keeps a massive amount of enemy points out of the fight. Otherwise, of course, some things out there might just have the raw damage just to blast the Death Star apart anyway. Some things can put out crazy amounts of mortal wounds in a turn, and it might well be enough just to overcome the defences anyway, even if it does take them a turn or two of really focused firepower. Again, definitely an option that maybe is a strong element of a list, but needs a bunch of other supporting things to go off and do the rest of the game, and for those other elements not to be too weak either. On the flip side of bunching up a bit, you can certainly play with multiple small unit armies. Generally, this is the idea of taking a whole load of small squads operating relatively independently, which does bring a whole bunch of advantages, efficient damage dealing and designating one thing at a time, and all of the units being kind of expendable, so if you lose any one of them, it's not the worst. Generally, the less elite factions in 40k tend to play around with this a bit, Things like Gene Stealer Cults, Astra Militarum, Sisters of Battle, Drukhari with small units out of Raiders. I guess maybe you could think about counting things with just a whole load of little units like Chaos Knight War Dog Spam. In general, Games Workshop seems to be wanting to incentivize units that are around about the 100 point mark or more. And it's not quite so common to see absolutely tons of little units at maybe say the 40 or 50 point mark these days. Having a bunch of small units really can be pretty handy. It means that you often get very efficient damage dealing and you force the enemy to overkill the squads 
by dedicating enough firepower to guarantee them dead. And it's quite nice for any armies with single unit innate abilities. Things like, say, a single hit reroll per unit goes further if you've got loads of units. Generally, having a bunch of small little units running around is typically going to be pretty good for objectives, actions, and board control. They can spread out happily, being a little bit less focused on getting core buffs from characters and things, and operate a lot more independently. As for downsides, it means that the units will typically be less viable for buffs like characters and stratagems and things. Character auras will be fine, but you might struggle to get them in aura range quite as easily. But a lot of abilities just target one unit, and you won't get as much out of them on smaller units like that. They could also struggle with melee as well, depending on what you're fighting. If, say, you've got two small units charging into an enemy, then one might do some damage, and then the enemy might interrupt and kill the other one, which would be a lot worse than just charging them with a big unit. On top of this, a few missions and secondaries reward killing units and not models. It's not quite as bad as kill points were back in 8th edition and previous, but it can be a potential downside when you're facing certain armies in certain missions. In general, for having a bunch of units, typically most armies tend to fill things of a bit more medium size, and you maybe don't get quite as many armies just trying to spam out a ridiculous amount of, say, 50-point units onto the board, at least not as much compared with previously. Moving on for actual playstyle in game, often fairly fast and fragile armies tend to want to play a bit of a game of hide and seek, hiding behind terrain and then striking out at the opponent bit by bit, rather than trying to do any sort of thing like expose their whole army to the enemy firepower at once. I feel like there's a fair few ways of describing it, people often talk about trading units, and whether or not you have units that can kill something that's more valuable than them before they die. Playing a bit more of an intelligent game of cat and mouse, and just scoring the objectives that you need to, and killing the enemy units that you need to, without necessarily trying to just rush forward and utterly wipe out the enemy unless it makes sense. Perhaps for typical armies for this, I feel like the Adeptus Auroritas maybe epitomise this playstyle, things like Repentia, Zephyrim, and Retributors that want to hide then jump out. Maybe Blood Angels, Jump Infantry, and Sanguinary Guard can do this quite well as well, and just about any of the fast armies can do this pretty credibly as well, things like Harlequins in their Star Weavers. In general, I feel like this is a pretty strong way to play, just make great use of any obscuring terrain that you have, and castle units within them, aim to jump between terrain to terrain, or potentially use a few other tricks to get units into battle, maybe a transport vehicle for a unit, or a deep strike or outflank with another, and basically try and ensure that the opponent can't hit back the majority of the army meaningfully. It's quite nice because you can take a lot of units that are just really focused on damage dealing and speed, and not really having to worry about how fragile they are. I feel like the factions that want to do this sort of thing generally want to have good control of the objectives, and particularly good secondary objectives help out quite a bit, so the opponent is more forced to come to them rather than the other way around, and perhaps play into their hands a bit. As for downsides, I feel like this kind of playstyle is very terrain dependent. If you're playing on set tournament terrain, then usually you can guarantee a certain level, but if you're playing on a bit more casual level, a fairly light terrain setup could certainly give you big problems. Again, with fast type armies, anything that can get lines of sight or barrage on them, that'll also have big benefits when you're targeting fairly fragile units. They might also not enjoy being in a matchup where they have to come towards the opponent to win as well, if, say, they've got just some really great secondary objectives that they can do. I feel like that's one important reason why, say, the Sisters of Battle tend to match up pretty badly against Necrons in competitive games, as they can't really afford to just sit back and trade out units like this, they need to be more aggressive. In a fairly similar vein, and maybe I should have merged this with the previous one, there's a more guerrilla warfare type approach. Maybe more so than just relying on speed and just jumping out and shooting things though, this is more about using sneaky tricks to hit the enemy before they hit you, and ideally escape after. In current 40k, I'd say the Gene Stealer Colts are maybe the kings of this, and the Trixie Craftworld Eldar also being a great example, with a whole ton of ways to engage the enemy without them being able to hit you back. Otherwise, for sneaky tricky armies in 40k, things like Alpha Legion Chaos Marines, Raven Guard Space Marines, and to an extent Harlequins with their powerful stratagems, they all have their own ways of either getting the Alpha Strike on you with pre-game moves or redeployments, or otherwise engaging you in a less fair fight. In general, all of these operate a fair bit differently, but often things like pre-game moves, deep strike mechanics, like the Gene Stealer Colt's improved one, Various things with move, shoot, move, like Eldar swooping hawks or battle focus, ignores line of sight weapons and good movement values, all of those can really help out. I feel like strong guerrilla warfare style armies will typically do at least fairly well on secondaries. It's usually quite hard to stop Gene Stealer Court players amassing a fair amount of victory points, even if they might or might not lose the game. Again, perhaps similar to the previous category, they're generally very bad durability when they're exposed. They are the need to hit the enemy devastatingly hard or find some way to hit and then be safe. 
and this needs to basically try and find ways to use all the clever tricks to their maximum advantage might make them a little bit trickier to play in game than some. It's certainly not helped by a whole load of things in 40k that counter various shenanigans pretty hard, say for example enemy forward deployment units blocking pre-game moves, space marine infiltrators denying deep strike in big bubbles, or similar for all spec scan just allowing enemies to gun your units off the table once they turn up from reserve. Even with a bunch of really nasty shenanigans, having to contend with those sort of options can make things quite tricky. Finally, and again a bit of a counterpoint to the previous ones, rather than playing games hiding behind terrain or using sneaky tricks, you can just play flat out aggressive, armies that generally tend to table their opponent, wiping them off the board, and taking the fight to the enemy often in their own deployment zone. I feel like this is often the way of choice for armies that might struggle to play any sort of hiding game, Say things like Imperial Knights, where you're not going to be able to hide your models, or Goths in Kill Rigs and Battle Cannons, where you're going to have some models exposed at some point, most of the Monster Mash or Heavy Dreadnought type lists. I feel like Leagues of Votan probably are generally going to fall into this category as well, just having to really lean into their obscene damage that they can do with their Judgment Tokens, maybe with things like Hernkin Pioneers winging around the battlefield, gunning things down. In general, these sort of lists are usually going to want to jump up the board reasonably quickly, send a lot of units into the midfield, and this could have the side effect of some pretty decent early game objective scoring. Typically, just by the units that they're taking, you're usually going to have a lot of very dangerous and durable units. Any combination of things that are fast, tough, and hard-hitting are good here, maybe followed up by a few grunts to hold objectives and things. As for downsides, I feel like being forced to be an aggressive army, and one that isn't going to be able to sit back and hold tight does have its downside, the opponent will have some counterplay. They could, for example, hold back and shoot your oncoming army for a turn or two and then counterattack very hard, potentially screen and move block, or if they've got better movement than you, potentially hide behind terrain and then jump out and get the first hit on your oncoming forces. It also means that if the opponent maybe isn't tabled or having the majority of their army destroyed, it means that you might have more trouble in the later game once a lot of your attacking forces are dead and the opponent might get some uninterrupted scoring on objectives in the last turn or so. So I must admit, this video has become a bit more of a big project than I thought it might have. I feel like there really are just an awful lot of ways that you can analyse 40k armies though, and big positives or negatives to going down one particular playstyle, compared with something a bit more balanced. As always, look forward to hearing your thoughts down in the comments below. What sort of Warhammer 40k army do you like playing, or gives you good success on the tabletop? And are there any other important army types that you think you might want to add to this list? If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Spets Tactics, but I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying quite a lot, then any support is massively appreciated on the channel's Patreon page, it is what allows me to keep on making really big videos like this, so if you are enjoying a fair bit, any support is massively appreciated. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.